I answered a blind ad in the Chicago Tribune newspaper to apply for a job as a uh, trainee at a brokerage company with a blind ad. I had no idea where it was or who it was. I received a response back to come report to Almond Grain on the 14th floor of the Board of Trade floor in 1960, 62 I think it was, and, and was hired by them. I've had 16 years of Catholic education I graduated Loyola University with a Bachelor of Science in Commerce in 1958, and I did some work at the University of Chicago with a graduate degree, which I never finished. My first job out of college was teaching school. I was a high school teacher at first at Crane Tech and then moved up to Sullivan High School in Rogers Park. I had graduated with a, a major in business and fi economics and finance and a minor in mathematics and education. I had probably about 40 or 50 more hours than I needed to graduate. I went to summer school. I taught at Solomon High School for two years. I taught freshman algebra, sophomore geometry, and economics to seniors. I worked for Elman Grain. I wanted to go into business for myself. I had worked for a man named Bernie Feinberg between my teaching career and working at the Board of Trade. Bernie Feinberg started out with currency exchanges, and I thought I'd either buy a currency exchange or else buy a seat in the Board of Trade. I was working at Almond Grain at the time, but I still had a big education in currency exchanges because of Bernie, who was a friend of mine. The currency exchange and a real estate company was $15,000, and a Board of Trade seat I could buy for $11,000. So I opted for the less expensive investment. A tough time beginning, I told you, the uh, first trade I bought was one contract of soybeans. I lost about $800. But eventually I worked in my way into the corn pit and had a small deck from Fawnstock. It was a small deck, and then a guy named Bob Willie asked me to be his assistant, and I had a big deck with him, but I lost that deck for other reasons, and I started trading again, and I was no good as a trader, and I had a debit, uh, $14,000 with Shatkin at the time, Shatkin Trading at the time. That was 1968, and I decided to pay my debt, sell my membership, and do other employment. So I did that. I went and sold the membership with Paul Dratz. I went to see Mr. Shatkin. I said, Mr. Shatkin, I sold my membership. I'm going to pay you back the $14,000. I had $3,000 left because I sold it for $17,000. And he said, why did you do that? I said, because I owe you money. He said, everybody owes me money. I said, well, it's too late now. I sold the membership. He said, I need a broker over at the Merck, Mercantile Exchange. Would you go over there? I said, no, I don't want to go over that exchange. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Another classic mistake I made. So I, for two years, from 1968 to 1970, <clears throat> I had a series of jobs. The first job I had was working at J.C. Penney, J.C. Penney, we'll call it, selling furniture. I didn't know uh, spruce from oak. A lady would walk in and say, what kind of wood is this, this table made of? I said, ma'am, that's genuine tree wood. I didn't know what I was talking about. My father, who wasn't a very good father, did finally land me a job as an iron worker for Local One. The union office was over at uh, Ashland and Chicago Avenue. I went over and signed up, got a union card, and I became a rod buster. There are two types of iron workers, structural work up high, and rod busters who do all the rebar work, the reinforcement rods. We work up high too, but mostly we're doing construction work for foundations, tying all the rebar rods together, and then once the rebar rods are like a skeleton, and they pour the cement around it, which turns into concrete. So I did that for almost a year, and that was good money. They were the uh, creme de la creme of the laborers. But the last job I had, we put on the two top floors of the telephone building at Harrison and Federal in the summer. And I'm up top of that roof, bending over, tying all these rods as they come up, you know, on the, the crane and the derrick, and I could see Ceres right across the street, right across the Eisenhower Expressway. And I said, I want to go back there. I'll be a good boy, and I'll behave myself. So the membership had gone up to $31,000, and 
And suddenly they dropped down to $17,000. And a friend of mine, Don Newman, called me up and said to back down $17,000. I called up Mr. Shatkin. I said, I want to come back. I talked to Mr. Feinberg again. He lent me the money again. Mr. Shatkin said, okay, come back. And Bertie Feinberg lent me $20,000. So I thought it would be enough to buy the membership. <clears throat> but that was in like July of, 19, of 1970. <clears throat> and by the time I went to buy the membership, they'd gone back up to $31,000. So I went to see Mr. Shatkin. I said, Mr. Shatkin, I, I want to come back and join the board, be a member of the Board of Trade, but I'm $11,000 short. I only have $20,000, and I have to pay $31,000 for the membership. He gave me a dirty look. He reached in his drawer, pulled out his checkbook, and wrote me a check for $11,000. And then he left for Europe with his wife. I paid him back in a week and a half. I started in the corn pit in August of 1970. He caught the, <coughs> the fungus corn blight market of 1970. Market had gone up limit on Monday. Tuesday it was called limit bid, but I was a little suspicious of it. Not that I knew all that much, just a gut feeling, a visceral feeling I had. And I was kind of inclined to sell just a little bit. The market opened up, up the limit, but I could see it was limit bid across the pit, but it was offered three or four cents lower next to me. And I, Marshall Smith, an old time broker, was bidding limit, and he couldn't see anyone else. I, sold them. I didn't have no idea what, how much I sold them at the time, like 350,000 bushels. And, and I sold it to him. By the time he gathered his count together, I bought it back from John Morris, four or five cents cheaper. I made $14,500 and paid Mr. Shatkin back. Hundreds, hundreds we brought in. There were very few people we didn't help. When I say we, I'm talking about my partner, Henry Shatkin. And he was always very benevolent and very generous and a lot of munificence in helping people. And we helped just about everyone that came, came to our office. My wife at the time, Mary Ann Kerrigan, Mary Ann Arbor, uh, she didn't like me coming down here. She thought it was too risky. and She'd rather have me just continue teaching, stuff like that. So she wasn't anxious about it, but she didn't object to it strongly. But so I, I came here in spite of her trepidation. Not only did I win her over, but I brought my two, her, her two brother-in-laws down also, Ed Duran and Mike Friel. And, and she subsequently, one of the sisters subsequently married Tom Madden, so I helped him a little bit too. Yeah, in the end she was fine. Matter of fact, after we were divorced, I brought her down. She was at the Mid-America Exchange also for one year. It kept exploding after that because we, then we created new memberships, Les Rosenthal and people like that, and Billy O'Connor and uh, some great leaders before me started expanding the membership. So we sold AM associate memberships, we sold item memberships, we sold com memberships, trading the options, and our 1,402 members swelled up to almost 4,000 by the time we were done. So the more bodies we had, the more trade we had, and the more volume we could, more capacity we had to absorb orders. And we introduced new contracts, we needed people to trade those contracts. So we had even associate memberships and things like that, uh, where people came in, if they traded a certain number of contracts, they received the membership for free. We, we wanted to inspire and energize and uh, encourage people to trade. So it, with the new facilities and new floor space, we had more room to trade. One time, there was a guy named Don Hutchinson, and he was actually a partner of mine, and he, for some reason, he, he wouldn't trade with me. I went after him in the pit, but they broke it up, okay. We had fist raised in that one, and whether I hit this guy in the wheat pit, I don't remember. It may have happened. But as I say, there's all kinds of stories about me that, a lot of fake news. Yeah. We get in fights over uh, somebody being off the market, somebody stealing a trade because they thought they were first, uh, somebody not trading with them, ignoring them, uh, somebody doing something inappropriate in the pit, uh, not advertising his wares or bids and offers properly, things like that. There was a great self-corrective mechanism in the pit. The pits were wonderful. They really were good, good crucibles for honesty and veracity and integrity. Because you're out in the open, if you do something wrong, you're going to have criticism. Because the, the, the idea was if you had one bad apple, the whole barrel of apples would be ruined. So we, we, we couldn't tolerate a bad apple. We had a few, though, but we, we, we eradicated them as soon as we found them. Well, I, I would bid for a million beans. I didn't want a million beans. I, I wouldn't do it very long. I, 
I'd flash it, uh, I'm, and they may be for 500 beans or something like that. And it was kind of a joke. I mean, we always said, I was only kidding. You can't say you're only kidding because if you bid for them and somebody said sold, you own them, baby. Yeah. And not much you could do about that. But spoofing went on in the pit, definitely it did. It goes on now, of course, in the, in the electronic markets the same way. But in the electronic markets, in the blink of an eye, you could put it in, 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 in a flash, and all of a sudden it's gone before you even can react to it. So spoofing does go on more in electronic markets, I think, than it did in open archive markets, because as I say, we made we may you be honest. And by the time you walked across the floor, you didn't have to watch the news. You had more gossip and more news, people whispering in your ear or talking to you as you walked across the floor. It was a, a receptacle of, of, of information from around the world, no matter what it was. And the camaraderie on the floor was wonderful. Yes, we fought, we argued with each other, but at the end of the day, we helped each other out. Whether it was <coughs> somebody you, you had a fight with in the pit, but if we fell out a debit and you needed money, many times, we, we, most of the time, we'd help them out, lend, lend money to each other. It was that type of, type of an environment. It was all men, for the most part. The first female member was Carol Orbitz in 1971, I think. Uh, but she didn't trade in the pit. We had very, it was all men. We had no women in the pit then. And uh, it was like a locker room in a sense. The language wasn't very nice. Uh, and it was rough and tough. But we men liked that. It didn't make any difference if you were a Harvard MBA or you were the son of an Italian immigrant whose father was a butcher, if you came down on the floor of the border trade and you had some merit and some common sense and some intensity and some discipline, you could do well there. So the ec economic opportunities were great. You could be from Winnetka, Illinois, or Bridgeport, Illinois, Bridgeport, Chicago, I should say. You were all equal on the floor. You had a card and a pencil, and your brains against everyone else. So it was. True democracy, uh, true meritocracy was your merit. It wasn't your family, where you came from. It was just who you were, what you were, and how disciplined you were. I belonged some soybeans once, and the market had gone up the limit quite a bit. And there was a way you could do the crush and make another 20 or 30 cents. If you were long, say, 100 beans, you could go over and sell meal and oil against it. and make more money by just selling your beans at the limit bid. And I, that one day, I, I was a little worried that the, that the market wouldn't uh, continue going up. I went up to the office and I talked to Eddie, uh, Henry Shatkin. Eddie Wilson was around at that. He was a huge speculator at the time. And I explained it to Eddie. I said, well, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go down to Florence, because meal was up the limit, so was oil. oil. And I'm going to make another 30 or 40 cents. I don't think Eddie Wilson understood it. I went downstairs, I sold the meal, I sold the oil, the beans opened up the limit, meal oil, oil, oil opened down the limit, and uh, you know, I made all the money. So uh, <clears throat> that was my biggest day. Well, the Angelus had some, they were big uh, speculators in soybean oil and edible oils, and they had some warehouse and some, uh, some storage capacity out in New Jersey, and it was filled up with salt water. And they topped it off with oil, and they would go and they would measure it, and then they'd report to the fellow downstairs that they had so much soybean oil, and then they would go to a bank and they borrowed money, they borrowed lots of money, and they would trade in the futures here in Chicago. And of course, it was all collapsed, it was all phony, it was, uh, and they, I think they went to jail. So that was one. Then we had the Billy Solestis scandal down in Texas, I forget what that was about, something with uh, selling. Uh, bins for corn, stuff like that. Um, around 1967, 68, we had the uh, Six Day War over in Israel. That was a big event, too. I was here for that. And then things quieted down until the 70s when Nixon came in. And a lot of things happened then. Of course, he went off the gold, the, the gold standard, and uh, we, were allowed to, we were allowed to trade gold. About that time, we had talked to Dr. Sander, Richard Sander, who was a, one of our real great uh, leaders at the Board of Trade, and we started trading, you know, Ginny May Futures, which was our first financial futures contract here at the Board of Trade. So that was uh, another event. And after that, we had the uh, inflation, 
high interest rates of Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. And then we had also the hostage situation in 1969, I think it was, in Iran. 79. 79, 79. And then uh, we had the Reagan, Reagan uh, you know, bull market in, in, in stocks. I worked my way up through the committee system, uh, right from the bottom, uh, floor committee, uh, membership committee. Uh, but that was a lot of work. We, 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 we did that in the afternoon. And I ran for the board of directors and was elected, I think, in the early 1980s. And I served on the board for a number of years and gradually worked up to vice chairman and, uh, and eventually chairman. I first ran for chairman against Billy O'Connor, and I lost by a few votes. Billy was kind of cute. He had paper. He said, I didn't realize there were so many mountain climbers around the Board of Trade. Because there were a few, and of course, they all supported me. But Billy and I were friends, and he supported me when I ran the, uh, the next time. My role was turned out to be pretty big. We had, uh, there had been a storm in London on Friday before the, the crash. And the London markets were down. And Monday, we had gone as a board. I was not just on the board of directors. I was on the executive committee to New York to have our board meeting in New York on Tuesday. That would be Tuesday the 20th, I think it was, of October of 1987. And we didn't do that a lot. We, we went there. And the idea was on the Monday, we would divide up the board. We had a big board, 28 people in groups of three or four. We'd visit our customers like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Kidder Peabody, and a couple like that. So I was with three or four people, and we go to Goldman Sachs. But that's when the market went down 500 and some points, the biggest stock market crash ever, and probably will be ever because it was such a large fall when the market was low, so the percentage would never be ever, I think, uh, equal. And we're standing there watching. I think uh, Corzina was there at the time. We're watching the market go down, down, down. It looked like the end of the world, quite frankly. It looked like Western civilization was going to come to an end. And nobody knew what to do. So they decided to send me and Don Andrew back to Chicago. And we would not attend a board meeting on Tuesday because in case something happened, we, uh, our markets opened. But that night, the markets in Asia were down sharply. And I, we didn't know it until the following day. But the whole board decided to come back. So we all gathered back here on Tuesday morning. Now the market had gone down from about 2,700 down to about 2,200. The Dow Jones is 27,000 now. Nobody knew what to do. All the markets started closing. The New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, because the market had gone down from 2,200 down to under 2,000, and it looked like no bottom. So we're arguing back and forth, and we're on the phone with the SEC, the CFTC, the Treasury, and the Federal Reserve, and the other exchanges. Phones were ringing all the time. I was the only one who said, keep the market open. I said, these markets are trading somewhere. Madoff had a third market at the time, and they were trading. You may not like the, the spread. It may be as wide as a, a massive truck going through it, but let them, we're free markets for free men. Keep the market open. I was about to lose the battle. Every market had closed in the world, except a little maxi contract at the Board of Trade. And all of a sudden, as I'm about to lose the battle, because <clears throat> I was just one person against the other four guys, and uh, the market stopped about 1,700 and rallied 200 points. And after that, the market started to creep higher and higher. And the other exchanges, the CBO, Amex, CME, New York Stock Exchange, all started to reopen. And the market closed higher that day. I did not know it. But a month or two later, I found out that Blair Hull had bought the bottom of the market. And Blair happened to be a friend of mine, not a good friend then, but we knew each other from the pit. We, we've become great friends ever since that time. He bought the bottom of the market, and the market rallied. So it really, was, he's the one who saved the Western world, not me. <laughs> Sometimes uh, curbing an order, not showing the order to the pit, we would show people uh, sometimes crossing orders with other people in the pit. Uh, we report that, and we had fines and uh, punishment for that, that type of behavior. The worst was, I think, there was a, a group who cleared to us, uh, Joey Giotano, his, his sister uh, Andrea 
Paul and his stepbrother, um, Joey Geo, I think his name was, and they had the corn wheat spread, and uh, they were stealing trades from that. And that was wrong. We kicked them out of the Board of Trade forever. They were banished forever. They could never come back in the industry. I saw people, when people were in trouble money-wise, they had debits. Other people would go and lend them money and fund their accounts to allow them to trade again. That was very good, I thought, of, of these people who would help. We helped each other a lot at the Board of Trade. Mr. Shad can help me. We, and when I said to him, Mr. Shatkin, what can I ever do to repay you? He said, just do unto others as I did it to you. And we never forgot that. And our firm was that way. The, the Goldberg brothers and Shatkin Arbor were, we were the biggest companies on the floor of the Board of Trade. And we spawned many. I mean, Ray Kahneman traded to us, and uh, Norm Singer traded to us, and uh, the whole group traded to us. And they went off and started their own firm, which was fine. Dorman, I think, traded to us. And uh, we didn't mind that. We liked to help people, and if they went off and started their own clearing firm, that was fine. And discipline. Discipline is very important on the trading floor. And by that I mean total discipline your whole life. Staying in good shape, exercising, eating the right foods. Because to trade in the pit all day long, you, you, you really had to have some physical ability to sustain it and some mental ability too. I've never had a drink of alcohol in my life. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never even had a cup of coffee. And I exercise, I run five marathons, I do a lot of running, climb mountains, and uh, still try to do all that stuff as much as I can. So I think that was it. I'm educated by the Jesuits, and we say in Latin, it's a sound mens and a sound corpo, a sound mind and a sound body. So you have to keep those two things together. Well, one name is Henry Shatkin. I mean, he certainly stands out. He was very well liked, probably better liked than me, quite frankly. And he never sought higher office like I did, but he supported me and he mentored me and he gave me a lot of good advice. And many times, I remember distinctly we had an issue about something and he said to me, like in Pinocchio, let your conscience be your guide. And if you do that, you let your conscience guide you, you generally decide right and wrong. Ralph Peters was big, uh, Ralph, uh, Howard Fisher was big, uh, uh, Dick Freimeyer started to be big, Eddie Wilson was big at the time, um, <clears throat> the O'Connors were big, Gene Cashman was kind of big at the time. The biggest issue was space. The biggest issue for us, I think, was a new trading floor. And I championed that. Billy O'Connor was my predecessor. We shared the same common goal of building a new trading floor. There were people against it. Les Rosenthal was against it, a friend of mine. We were all friends. He didn't think it was necessary. And I didn't see the coming of the digital era. So Billy lost it two to one. I ran against uh, Dale Lorenzen. And I said, I'm going to build a new trading floor if I'm elected chairman. If you vote for me, you're voting for a new trading floor because I'm going to get it passed. And so I ran on that platform, and I won. And immediately I had a membership vote, and I passed it two to one the other way. And not that I'm a great speaker. It's just the fact that I think the logic for it at the time was so evident because the floor was so crowded. The pits were so crowded you couldn't move. So the demand was there for more space. So I just captured that spirit and used that as my campaign platform and had it passed. Midway through the building cycle, Eurex was started in 1992 over in Frankfurt, Germany. Now, mind you, the Chicago Board of Trade was the world's largest futures exchange since 1848 to 1998. 150 years, we were the world's largest future. Somewhere around 95, 96, Eurex, Deutsche Boards, came over and they started proselytizing our traders, like Ray Kahneman, people like that and Harris Brumfield, mostly in the financial markets, not the grain markets, financials. And they started distributing free computers for these guys to trade and gave them special deals and special access. So I would say my first recognition of them was about 96, 1996. By that time, Project Day was struggling somewhat and 
we had built this new trading floor. We hadn't quite opened yet. We had just done something. It was a big deal for the Board of Trade, and something I did together with my colleagues. The Bund contract was huge in London, okay? It was a German 10-year bond contract, but it was traded open outcry in London at Life Exchange. And we did a deal with Jack Wigglesworth, who was the chairman. We became pretty good friends. We went to London. They came here for all this, you know, big fanfare and big promotion effort. And we had an open, out, open outcry linkage here when they closed. I think it was like 11 o'clock in the morning. We started trading the Bund contract here because 11 o'clock would be, uh, that would be, it would be like 5 o'clock in, in the afternoon in London. And we would continue, we just morph over, we could trade it in the Board of Trade. It was wonderful for a while. The Bund contract was a huge contract. And they would do the Bunds against the 10 year note contract. It was a great, great spreading operation. But Eurex was trading the Bund contract too electronically. But life was huge feeding it. And Jack Wigglesworth came to Chicago. We had a big opening over at Navy Pier. Mayor Daly was there and all kinds of press and all kinds of people were there. And Jack Wigglesworth got up in front of the crowd. He said, there is no way the Huns would ever take the, the Bund contract away from life because we have more people employed in the city of London than they have working. You know, and there are more banks in the city of London than all of Germany. And there's no way they're going to take that Bund contract from life. They did. They, like a panzer movement, panzer group running through Poland on September 1st, 1939, they came in and they took that one contract away, one, two, three. And by 1999, seven years later, Eurex became the world's largest futures exchange on volumes, contracts of volume traded. I saw it coming because the, the Eurex trade just kept expanding and expanding. And I went to Eurex and I did a deal to, to trade the, the one contract here with us electronically on Eurex, I got that passed. The members hated me for it at the time. A lot of them didn't like it. In those days, there was no, it wasn't even close. The Board of Trade was dominant. The CME was always just a, a backward exchange nobody cared about. They traded butter and eggs and pork bellies, things like that. But Leo Malama changed that with financial futures and the IMM. And when that happened, they were wise. They picked euro dollars. We picked bonds. They picked euro dollars, which were huge. And then they started the uh, Globex and got the S&P index. All because of Leo, as far as I know, and Barry Lind and a group of guys he had. When I was chairman, Jack Sander was chairman of the Merck, and the competition between and I was pretty vicious because he wanted to be the world's largest. He wasn't. CME wasn't. Board of Trade was. So there was a time there when they started counting uh, Exercise and assignments and cash versus the futures trades. You don't you don't pay commissions on you don't pay transaction fees on that. So I call it the phony count over there. They, got, they were a little mad at me about that, but uh, so the competition between and I were pretty keen uh, during the 90s. And it was also before I was chairman, even in the 80s, when the Merck's really started to grow and. Uh, and, and progress because of the financial futures over there under Leo's leadership. And they started trading E-minis, which was another brilliant move. A lot, of, a lot of people didn't like Leo at the time, but Leo was a visionary. It should have been the other way around. But I have to give Charlie Carey credit. He knew Terry Duffy, and they did a deal. And we, we caught a break because that exchange ice was bidding against the CME, so yeah. that forced the price of stock up. Yeah, we were. I would have thought the Board of Trade would survive, but quite frankly, we didn't have the leadership they had over there. Not that Terry Depp is a great leader, but Leo and people like that. Terry, Terry has good, good political connections. He's got good political senses. We would have them in here, both Democrat and Republican. They'd come here and on the fifth floor, we'd have lunch with them and give them an honorarium. We'd give them a check. Not a big check. Two thousand, a thousand dollars, whatever, from our PAC, our political action committee. We did that week after week. And they wouldn't only be have Mr. Mike Forrester come up and say, have lunch with these fellows and tell them, he would tell them his concerns or we'd bring up people from the floor, talk about taxes, legislation, transaction taxes and things like that, how it would affect the Board of Trade. So it didn't really make much difference because money talks and they all want the money, no matter if you're Republican or Democrat.
sure we were more democratic, but Donovan was a very skillful politician. If you'd walk into Donovan's office and he'll say, gee, that's a nice tie you have on, nice shoes. He, he, he always softened people up with a nice comment. He was very good at that. It took me a long time to learn how to trade. I was a, a poor speculator. I was a poor, a poor scalper. <clears throat> I was a decent broker. But when I learned how to spread, that's when I started making money. Because I looked around the floor of the border trade. It took me a while to understand this. And the scalpers made some money. Speculators made and lost money. Brokers made decent money. But the ones with the biggest houses and the biggest cars were the spreaders. Like Jordy Glassman, Henry Shatkin, Stern. Uh, the Goldberg brothers, people like that. So I learned how to spread. <laughs>